With Lesson 27, we're now looking at the third aspect of Jesus, his preaching. We're going to look at some things that he taught, some stories that he told, and some coaching that he gave to insiders, that is, his apostles and close disciples. So Lesson 27 is one of the first and very famous sermons of Jesus. It was in his hometown synagogue in Luke chapter 4. It's interesting that Luke is the only one that tells us this, and I think I know why. Here's the question. What did Jesus have to say about social justice? Uh, that's a hot topic these days, and most churches just focus on the doctrine of Jesus. But from the very beginning of his preaching, he leaned into social justice. We'll read a scripture in a moment, but let's put this on a mental map. Most people who have been Christians for a while know what's called the Great Commission. To go into all the world and, and te- baptize him in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe everything that Jesus taught them. Okay, so that's the Great Commission. It's repeated in all of the Gospels and the book of Acts. But the very first Great Commission was not after the resurrection. It was right here in Nazareth at the beginning of his career. Watch as Jesus unpacks his goal for Gentile evangelism. Let's read the core of what Jesus taught on. Because he would go to his hometown synagogue and the chazan, that is the, the person in charge of the service, would hand him a scroll. Because Jesus combined a couple of different passages, we know this wasn't the reading of the day. This was the sermon. Because it was in the sermon that the preacher got to choose the text or texts for the message. And this is what Jesus chose to read from Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is what the Bible calls jubilee. Every 50 years, according to Leviticus 25, every 50th year, all debts were released. It was a way of keeping people from punishing and grinding poverty. Let's say there's a drought or a storm or a death of a father or barrenness for any number of reasons. There could be poverty that sits on a family. To keep that from going from generation to generation, every 50th year, all debts were supposed to be released. Now, we have no historic evidence of that ever actually happening. But it was God's idea, and it's actually a good idea. Not that you would discourage entrepreneurial uh, efforts. Not that you would discourage hard work. But that you would protect from the grinding poverty that comes from chaos or crisis. Now, this passage comes from Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. But Jesus stopped short. He didn't finish reading verse 2. Here's how it finishes. And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Now, clearly Jesus is the judge. That is the eschatological judge, the end of the world kind of stuff. But it's too early for that. And what Jesus wants to talk about here, and he stops short of the final judgment because he he doesn't want to get there just yet. He will. He wants to impress upon his audience in Nazareth, where, where this all started, his own hometown, that we are going to be a people of impeccable ethical character. Not just in what we avoid interpersonally. We don't drink, we don't chew, we we don't sleep around. But what we do for those, and particularly those outside of our immediate family, our immediate community. The reaction to the message was, well, let's just say it was poor. (laughs) They start asking, they're kind of amazed that Jesus would say something like this. Because because think about it. Jesus said, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing today through me. That's right. The the eschatological freedom that is prophesied in the Bible, it's going to come through me. The Messiah prophesied in the Bible, that's me. That would be like me standing up in church and saying, you know the book of Revelation? Yeah, that's me. That's pretty much my life. You can imagine how well that would go over. 
So they begin questioning him. Isn't this Joseph's son? He's the son of a blue-collar carpenter. And don't we have his brothers and sisters in the village with us now? He doesn't seem that stellar. And then Jesus turned and he said, you know, there's a, there is a proverb, physician, heal thyself. And you're going to say that to me. There's another prophet, that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. It's coming true right here, right now. And then he launches into a couple of stories about Elijah, who healed Naaman, a leper, and Elisha, that raised a widow's son from the dead. Both of them, great prophets, both of them did their greatest work outside of Israel. So not only is Jesus encouraging them to be impeccable with ethics, that is, compassion for their own people, but now he's suggesting it goes beyond the boundaries of Israel so that others could know the love of God. And that was, it was a mess. They were so upset with Jesus, suggesting not only that they actually fulfill the year of Jubilee, but do it for outsiders, that they took him to the edge of a cliff and we're getting ready to push him off the cliff to kill him. Well, th obviously they didn't. And it's one of those events I wish I knew how. Did he just like miraculously disappear? Or did he stare them down and walk through their midst? W we may never know. But this we do know. That if we are going to be Jesus followers, it begins where his preaching began. With compassion on the poor and a preference for outsiders.